right, so our first lecture up for ICM EENT is going to be eye disorders. And because there's quite a few different eye disorders to cover within this module, we actually broke it up into two different sections. So today we're going to be covering part one, which includes conjunctival, corneal, lacrimal, lid, some neural ophthalmologic and orbital disorders. Uh, next go around, we'll cover some of the deeper structures of the eye. Here are your learning objectives as always. Uh, and for these learning objectives, they're pretty consistent throughout the module. Uh, they're uh, all related to these conditions that you're covering today. So here is our lecture topic outline. We're going to be covering uh, all of these different uh, subcategories within uh, the headers. These are all from your pants blueprint. So we're going to go through one by one. Uh, you'll also notice throughout these slides we have uh, kind of more of a color-coded system, uh, so just kind of pay attention to the different boxes that I have for you uh, so that you can kind of get everything down as you go through the slides. All right, so the eye. This is a quick recap of the anatomy of the eye. Recall that there is the thick white outer structure to hold the, the integrity of the eye and have a place for those muscles to attach. That's known as the sclera. The second layer of the eye is called the choroids, where a lot of the vessels and pigmentation uh, are within the, the interior of the eye. The innermost layer is the retina, which we know houses all of the rods and cones that help give us the neural signals that go to our brain. We also have back in the back the optic nerve, as well as the optic disc. Uh, towards the front of the eye, we have the cornea, which is the thick outermost layer, is translucent. Uh, we have the anterior chamber, the iris, the lens the ciliary bodies and muscles, uh, and, oops, excuse me, whoa, went a little bit too fast, and uh, as you can see how the eye kind of fits together, also a lot of things we're covering today are external to the eye, so making sure that we remember that we have the palpebral fissure that, that is in between the two lids of the eye, we have the upper eyelid, lower eyelid, the uh, lacrimal carnuncle, tear ducts, uh, etc. So we'll try to cover some of the anatomy as we go on, but um, if you are familiar with the way that the eye works, the anatomy of it, these conditions tend to be a lot easier to digest as you go through them. So first off, something everybody's familiar with, pink eye. Everybody's heard of pink eye or has had pink eye at some point in their life, so it's a nice place to start because it's familiar to us. So when we talk about pink eye, the fancy medical term that we call it is conjunctivitis. Now conjunctivitis is a blanket term, um, essentially meaning inflammation or infection of the conjunctiva. Now remember there are two types of conjunctiva on the eye. There is the palpebral, which are on the undersides of the eyelids, and the, uh, and the bulbar conjunctiva. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we know that conjunctivitis, is, again, is a blanket term. So there are three kind of subcategories of conjunctivitis that we tend to talk about the most. And two of them are infectious. One is non-infectious. The infectious versions are viral and bacterial conjunctivitis. The non-infectious is going to be allergic conjunctivitis. And it is important that we know the differences between all three of them because, let me get, let me get my little presenter up here, a little pen. I like to draw. So uh, the difference between them is going to be very subtle. Uh, sometimes, sometimes we can't quite tell the difference and we just kind of have to treat empirically. But what I'm going to try to present to you is the subtle differences between the three different major types of conjunctivitis and how to differentiate them both in clinical practice and on your test. All right, so starting off, we'll start off with viral conjunctivitis, which is the most common, the most common type of conjunctivitis, or pink eye. Now, we see this a lot in children. Uh, if anyone has kids or has ever been around kids, we know that they touch everything. They put everything in their mouth. They touch their face. They touch each other's face. Kind of just don't have that 
that little personal bubble. <laughs> and so they tend to spread this pretty rapidly. We see it a lot in midsummer to early fall, but it can happen any time of the year. Now, the most common type of viral conjunctivitis is adenovirus. Uh, don't worry about the type 3, adenovirus. And it is highly contagious, meaning pass it from one to the other. Also contagious uh, by self-inoculation, meaning you start with one eye infected and through process of cleaning that eye or just, you know, living, you touch your other eye and it can cross-contaminate. So uh, a lot of times these patients will, by the time they present, will have it in both eyes, although it, it tends to start in one eye first. Now, how do these patients present? Well, we said conjunctivitis was inflammation of the conjunctiva. As you can see here, you can see the bulbar conjunctiva uh, are injected. It's red, pinkish colored. Um, in addition, specific to viral conjunctivitis, because it is caused by a virus many times, adenovirus especially, presents with other uh, viral symptoms such as upper respiratory symptoms, uh, runny nose, stuffy nose, sore throat, fever, malaise. Um, these patients tend to have a lot of mucoid or watery discharge, not pus-like discharge, but more watery. Uh, and it's pretty copious, so they get a lot of discharge, a lot of watery, runny eyes. Looks like they're crying constantly. Uh, now remember, it is highly contagious. They say swimming pools can be a vector for this. Uh, I don't know if that is substantiated with uh, you know scientific proof, but it's just one of those things that people say, tend to say. I also see a lot like in daycares uh, spreading within families. Um, it again may start in one eye and spread to the other and occasionally now remember these viruses didn't read your textbook so sometimes it can cause a little bit of what we call matting I don't know if you've ever you know fallen asleep and when you wake up your eyes are just a little bit kind of glued shut you got that what you call sleep in your eyes you know you got that little matting on the, the lid margins you can get some occasional matting with viral conjunctivitis where your eyes kind of get glued shut and you have to kind of wipe that uh, residue away, although the matting is more common in bacterial than in viral. Now, physical exam wise, you're going to see again the red or pink eye. The discharge should be clearish, clear ish, it doesn't have to be completely clear, if it ha but it shouldn't be purulent. Uh, a lot of watery, wateriness to the eyes. And uh, because it's caused by a virus, a lot of times you will get. Uh, pre-auricular lymphadenopathy and sometimes even a little bit of like, kind of an anterior cervical or, or submandibular <clears throat> adenopathy as well. How do you make the diagnosis? Well, with most of our ENT conditions, diagnosis is going to be made clinically. You see the eyes, they're pink. You talk to the patient, you get the history, you make the diagnosis. Um, the good thing about viral conjunctivitis, whether you get the diagnosis or not, it is self-limited, meaning that there is nothing that you're going to do for this patient that's going to cure them other than uh, tell them what you think they might have. Um, one thing that we do not do for these is a virus. Important to educate your patients that antibiotic drops will not help if it is a virus. Uh, what will help generally uh, is cool compresses like cool towels, um, and artificial tears to help because the eyes do tend to feel uh, not so much painful, but more uncomfortable, where you kind of feel like maybe you got a little bit of a grittiness, form body, kind of stingy, burny um, sensation to the eyes. Um, you can use some of the over-the-counter like Visine drops or antihistamine drops if they're severe itching, but I wouldn't consider that first line at all. All right, moving on, talk about bacterial pink eye. Okay, so bacterial pink eye, as you can notice the difference in the picture, you get purulent discharge. This is a yellowish, neutrophilic disgustingness. <laughs> All right, so in these, you do tend to see it a little bit more in adults than you do in children. Viral, like I said, is, is very uh, prevalent in pediatric population. Um, you can get certain bacterial infections in the neonate, which we will talk about separately. That's different. Uh, we're talking about generalized bacterial conjunctivitis. So the, the main players in this are going to be uh, strep pneumoniae, but staph aureus is one that I hear a lot. There's also uh, H. flu, uh, and they're all by direct contact. You, know, you touch the bacteria, the bacteria gets in the eye and prol proliferates. Um, 
You can also get auto inoculation with chlamydia and gonorrhea. These two are the ones that we're going to talk about separately uh, because they do tend to present uh, differently than just the generalized bacterial conjunctivitis. And and like I said, it, it you get them by having contact with infected genital secretions as if when you're born, right? You come out of those general area, you get inoculated with the infection. So we do have some measures that we put in place to try to prevent this type of infections in the neonates, uh, but there are something that you should know about. Um, so lab work, I have never, I will use the word never, I've never ordered a culture or gram stain of eye secretions before. Um, I've never seen an infection that's been absolutely horrible where they look like their eyes about to fall out. Most of the time with pink eye, it's a clinical diagnosis, but know that you can do a culture and gram scene if maybe it's not improving like you think it should, um, or, you know, if the patient is severely immunocompromised or having other problems with their eye. So how do they present? These patients present similarly to viral conjunctivitis, except kind of a, a little bit worse. So they get conjunctival inflammation, injection. Um, they get a profuse purulent discharge so it's definitely a different color it usually starts in one eye and then you can again self inoculate the other eye uh, a lot of crusting and matting more so than even with the viral and uh, when they wake up like in the morning or after a nap if it's a kid or an adult your eyes are literally glued shut with all this mat matting so you have to kind of get warm water and a little towel and kind of clean those lashes to kind of open up the eye unglue it um, as we'll see throughout this lecture, contact lens wearers are more prone to a lot of these things. So if you're a contact lens wearer, make sure that you are, uh, using your best eye care, uh, procedures, uh, foreign body sensation, uh, and they tend, because it's just inflammation of the conjunctiva, you should not have photophobia or any visual loss unless it's just kind of obscured by the matting and the, the purulence. Uh, physical exam, again, you're going to note discharge. Sometimes they'll have a little bit of itchiness, um, discharge. And, and then if it's an SCD, they might have some worse findings, which we'll talk about later. So diagnose, again, clinically, you can get a culture. But listen, again, I've never had to get one before. Treatment for this, different from viral. Uh, we will continue, instead of using cool compresses, a lot of times you can use warm compresses. And then antibiotics are, are the main, say, topical antibiotics. So we can use um, a combination of like a trimethoprim or a polymy polymyxin. Um, you'll want to avoid neomycin because there is an allergic reaction that forms with those. And then they don't need corticosteroids in this case. They're not going to help. Now, for gonorrhea and chlamydia, you have to, you, you don't use just topical. You tend to give other medications along with it, but those are specific. We'll cover them a little later. <clears throat> now, let's talk about the non-infectious type of conjunctivitis, uh, allergic conjunctivitis. So a lot of folks have allergies. Allergies are very prevalent, and one of the manifestations of allergies can be an allergic conjunctivitis. Um, also, it has to do with the with what you're exposed to. Um, it, it can be seasonal, uh, like with certain spring predilections, uh, hay fever, asthma, eczema. They all kind of fall into that in atopy. They all kind of fall into that same kind of category. There is a specialized version of allergic conjunctivitis that gets mentioned every now and then on exams called vernal keratoconjunctivitis. conjunctivitis. Vernal refers to the word spring, so we think of it as um, kind of this uh, seasonal uh, finding. And on these, it tends to occur in kind of a childhood, early adulthood, and they, they get this cobblestone appearance underneath their eyelid. Now, this is not typical allergic conjunctivitis. This is called vernal keratoconjunctivitis. conjunctivitis. They also get these little nodules on their um, cornea. Now... Uh, allergic conjunctivitis, so like just the plain old allergic conjunctivitis, if you can remember one word from all of this, remember itching, okay? Allergic conjunctivitis almost always comes with itching and severe itchiness, you know, where patients are just constantly just scratching their eyes as they just itch so much. Um, 
It can be caused by you know, seasonal allergies. It can be caused by wind, dry eye, smoke, uh, dander, pet dander. I know for me specifically, uh, I'm allergic to, to pet dander, especially the cats. And <clears throat> I spent the night at my friend's house. I was laying on her couch and she had a cat. Uh, and I guess there was fur on the couch. I slept on it. When I woke up, my eyes literally looked like this. It had chemosis. They were red. I even had matting associated with it. They were super itchy and and uncomfortable. And it was all just because of being exposed to the cats, which I was not typically exposed to. Um, In contrast to infectious, uh, allergic tends to be bilaterally from the onset. Unless you get something in like one eye and then it starts with one. Um, Itching again is the predominant uh, symptom can also get what's called chemosis, which is actually swelling of the conjunctiva. You can see it's kind of elevated here. That is chemosis. It's actually quite striking when you see it in person. Um, conjunctiv- conjunctival and eyelid edema. So you can get some edema associated with it. You get injection and you can have some watery or mucoid discharge, but not purulent. <clears throat> the diagnosis is also made by history and exam. And... Uh, if after the fact, you know, this patient is getting recurrent allergy type symptoms, you can perform the immunologic type testing, allergy testing, if needed. So treatment, of course, you want to avoid the culprit. So if you know specifically that it's a cat that causes you to get it, then stay away from cats, right? Um, so avoiding the specific allergens. The medications that we tend to use are topical eye drops, vasoconstrictors, or antihistamines, which you can either get over the counter or a prescription. Uh, topical mastil stabilizers. Uh, there's other antihistamines that can be prescribed. Um, there's a whole bunch of different medications that can be used, including NSAIDs, trying to reduce the inflammation. Sometimes even when it's really, really bad, we have to use, um, topical steroid drops. However, as primary care PAs, we should not be the ones prescribing topical steroid drops. We should always refer to an optometrist or ophthalmologist to have that done. All right, so now let's talk about gonorrhea and chlamydia because they deserve a little bit of specialized discussion. Now, I'm sure you can see here that gonococcal conjunctivitis is like bacterial conjunctivitis, but like horrible. Like, it looks like their eyes about to fall out their head, right? And there's so much purulent discharge. Uh, so gonococcal conjunctivitis is, it's not common, but it can cause conjunctivitis. Uh, like we mentioned before, this, this is typically, you see this in neonates after they uh, are delivered. So they have vaginal delivery. And they get this copious, about, you know, two days or so after they're delivered, they start getting this really copious uh, purulent discharge. And this is an ophthalmologic emergency because it can spread just past the conjunctiva and get into the cornea and cause perforation, which we see here. There's a kind of a swelling. It looks like the the integrity of the eye has been uh, compromised. Uh, We give ceftriaxone and then we do... uh, prophylactic treatment a lot of times in neonates um, if there's suspicion to help prevent this Um, and that's usually topical all right so chlamydia on the other hand is not as purulent um, and it takes a little longer to set in so we usually see it if it's going to be in a neonate usually between you know more of like five to ten days So a little further out of the delivery phase. And you can get these not just in in the neonate, but pretty much anyone can get a chlamydial eye infection. And worldwide, it's one of the more common infectious cause of blindness because it can cause severe scarring of the tarsus and cause a trachoma, which is kind of a long-term blindness because of it. And you can see that here, the opacity of the cornea so treat treatment of this it would be a a dose of azithromycin um, but you have to kind of keep an eye on them because surgical treatment if you if it gets deep within you can have deformities and and trouble with that so you might have to you have to have this seen and treated by a specialist Um, all right moving on 
There's one more quick conjunctival lesion that we see. Uh, this one is in fact benign. Uh, it's called a pinguecula. So a pinguecula is this, it's not as not pathologic, but it's a normal raised yellowish kind of fatty looking plaque, uh, uh, usually on the nasal side. And these pinguecula, as you can see here, kind of look like a little fat deposit in the, in the white part of the eye. And it always respects the cornea. It, does ne it never crosses the cornea. So I think of pinguecula, it has the word pingu in it. It looks like a little penguin to me, and penguins are nice. They respect the cornea. Moving on, <clears throat> we're going to talk about some of the corneal disorders, and we'll go one by one, we'll talk about them, work through them. So remember, the cornea is the um, this area on the front part of the anterior portion of the eye. It is clear, it is what light comes through um, and is sent through the iris and through the lens to help us to see, right? To create neural images that our brain perceives as sight. And so cataracts is an abnormal opacity of the lens of the eye. Okay, so the lens of the eye, not the cornea, okay? The lens of the eye. And so the, it is in fact the leading cause of blindness worldwide, worldwide. Um, and we see it here, at least in the United States, we see it more in elderly population. At, by the time we reach a certain age, most of us will have a small degree of opacity in our lenses. It happens as, uh, with, with, with age, with sunlight. Um, if you think about how the lens works, I mean, it, ha it has to uh, just send that light directly through uh, so that it hits the right spot in the back of the eye. And so any little um, abnormality to it can cause problems. Now, in this, like we say here, there's a lot of risk factors that we can do to to make it more likely that we will develop cataracts. I think almost all of us have seen cataracts. You get this cloudiness, but it's a cloudiness of the lens, not the cornea, which is really important to make a differentiation. So getting older... Can't, can't really prevent that. Uh, smoking and alcohol also can be risk factors. Sunlight exposure, diabetes, uh, metabolic syndrome, torch infections in kids, uh, which I'm sure you just talked about in OB-GYN. Uh, and also you can get it with prolonged systemic or inhaled steroids and statins. Diagnosis is going to be made clinically. You're going to see it. Patients come in usually... Um, complaining of kind of this progressive loss of vision but it's not really like a vision loss where you're seeing black it's more kind of uh hazy vision um and it's painless it's usually bilateral and you also can get some kind of fixed spots if you get certain areas of opacity that are worse than others because you're looking through a i think of it kind of like when my kiddos need me to clean their glasses they both wear glasses and sometimes they look at them like how can you see there's like fingerprints and like smudges all over their glasses I think of that as kind of like the cataracts right you got like a smudgy lens that you're looking through so you can have decreased uh, color perception loss of contrast sensitivity so you're seeing blurry in other words and you can also get uh, glare and halos around light so p patients tend to have poor vision especially like at night 
Um, what on physical exam, when you shine a light in there, because you're looking through an opacified lens, you might have an absent or reduced red reflex. Um, you'll see kind of a yellowish brown discoloration of the lens. Uh, and then it'll have a harder time seeing the fundus, uh, seeing the, the retina, the back of the eye, because you're looking through a cloudy lens. And like we mentioned, it's usually bilateral. Treatment. Uh, well, you can use some glasses and things uh, to help delay having to. For instance, my mom has very mild cataracts for now, so she wears sunglasses. She makes sure she doesn't smoke and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but the definitive treatment and and one when, when patients are having significant trouble is corrective surgery. So they actually go in and remove the opacified lens and replace it with a synthetic lens like this. And it kind of just falls into place. And and then uh, patients have pretty, pretty good results with these synthetic lenses. Moving on. So talking about cor corneal ulcers. Now, the cornea, remember we said, is uh, pretty thick and the cells are turned over pretty quickly in that area. Um, when we have uh, either a trauma or an infection of some sort to the, the eye, whether it be from contact over overwearing or just a generalized infection, we can develop an ulcer. An ulcer, just like it sounds, is like a little crater or disruption of that cornea. And corneal ulcers are not good. They are they can be quite serious to the point where they can even erode all the way through and and go through the, the layers of the cornea. Uh, so you you should look for ulcers, and if you see them, they should be referred to ophthalmology. Um, immediately or maybe not like like rush them to within an ambulance but they need to go that same day to see ophthalmologist um, a lot of times you'll actually be able to see the the ulcer kind of with your naked eye sometimes you can't though early stages you'll actually have to kind of use some fluorescein stain to kind of see that ulcer um, but what you'll see is a disruption of the cornea it usually looks like a little crater uh, the main presenting symptoms for these patients is pain. The, the corneal ulcers is super painful. Um, they also feel like there's something stuck in their eye. Uh, they might have noticed a white spot on their cornea. They get a lot of tearing. And depending how deep the cornea goes, the, the ulcer goes into the cornea, you can actually get photophobia um, because it gets into that, that kind of anterior chamber area. And in that area, any movement of the iris with the dilation or, or constriction of the, the iris can cause significant pain. Um, we also see it more commonly in patients that are immunocompromised or that have diabetes, and especially those that are contact lens wearers, okay? Especially those that wear them kind of like overnight uh, for weeks at a time, months at a time. Uh, on physical exam, again, you're looking for the, this little um, area on this on the cornea where there is a little pacified or eroded, um, you'll also notice that you do get uptake of fluorescein, which if you recall from my intro lecture, is a little strip of fluorescent dye that you place on the eye. Anytime you have loss of integrity of the cornea, it uptakes that dye and you'll be able to see it with a blue light, sometimes even with just the naked eye. Uh, a lot of times, because the, there's infection involved with ulcers, you'll get a mucopurulent discharge associated with it, especially with pseudomonas. Um, and then corneal structure, uh, culture should be obtained before starting antibiotics. So when you do have an ulcer, remember I said with conjunctivitis, never get the culture. I mean, I'd say never, hardly ever, never, ever. But with, with, um, with ulcers, you should get a culture before you start because if things are getting worse and you've already started antibiotics, you might not be able to identify what bacteria is causing it. So how do you make the diagnosis? Like we said, we use a fluorescein stain and culture, uh, although you'll treat empirically until you know what the culprit is. How do we treat? Well, remember we said that these ulcers tend to cause inflammation of kind of that anterior chamber area, the iris and such. So we tend to prescribe cycloplegics, which dilate the pupil. And when the pupil is dilated, it's not reacting to light over and over again. 
And so that causes um, less pain. So it's not moving as much. We also obviously need to prescribe topical antibiotics. Uh, if you have a patient that's wearing contacts, you should cover for pseudomonas like a tobramycin or some sort of flu fluoroquinolone. And then uh, you can put patches on there. There are some patches that are like healing, almost like healing contacts uh, that that are very that are prescribed by uh, op ophthalmologists. Uh, I've never seen one nor had access to prescribe them, but they do make them. Uh, and then following up, these are going to be need, need to be followed up with an ophthalmologist, uh, like I said, on an urgent basis. They're going to have to monitor for healing, uh, but you do want to avoid topical anesthetics. So they do make drops that numb your eyeball. You want to stay away from those because uh, pain is a good thing because pain tells us that something's wrong with us that we should go get it checked out. When we numb the pain too much, we can risk injuring our eye more or we can't tell when things are getting worse. So keratitis uh, is, is infection or inflammation. Uh, and it, this, anytime you have a keratitis, it is uh, urgent. You know, this can lead to severe visual impairment corneal perforation, blindness, and or loss of the eye. So keratitis can be also associated with ulcers. It's kind of when that ulcer, that infection gets deeper within the, um, the cornea. Uh, and so we see it again with contact lens uh, wearers. There are most commonly pseudomonas is the culprit. Again, we're going to do same, the same things that we did with the ulcer that we do with keratitis because it's usually kind of on a spectrum. Uh, so like here, you are able to see the ulcer and the, um, the sediment that's built up in the anterior chamber. So what you see is inflammation of the cornea um, with photophobia, red eye, and infectious keratitis can be caused by bacteria, virus, or fungi. It can also be even caused by parasites. Um, severe cases, you can get what's called a hypopion which is this sediment or, or kind of a pus accumulation in the anterior chamber. Um, we will, throughout the next couple slides, try to differentiate between bacterial and fungal, although I have seen very few test questions uh, that ask you to differentiate them. It is kind of good to be familiar. So bacterial, we tend to see the contact lens wears with pseudomonas, pain. You get an inflamed cornea. Uh, with some opacification, ulceration, and then again, because it's going into that anterior chamber, any movement of the iris with light uh, causes pain. Uh, you also get a lot of tearing. So fungal is usually more insidious, takes a little longer to progress. Uh, you also can see some ulceration or even intact corneas. And the next slide will show a couple of comparisons and contrasts. So you get inflammation of the cornea. That's what keratitis means. Uh, but bacteria tend to present with some sort of opacity or infiltrate. So you can see them here, bacteria. Uh, fungal tends to be more feathery along the edges, if you can see that there. Heaped margins, and then like, like in other places, satellite lesions. A couple of other causes of keratitis that we, that we mentioned but haven't talked about in depth yet is viral, which we're going to cover in a minute on herpes keratitis, and then parasitic, we'll cover in a sec. So treatment. Ulcerations, if they're severe, should be hospitalized because you can actually erode all the way through the cornea and that can cause an open globe problems um, and sight impairing uh, issues. Ulcer, ulcers, you want to scrape the material, send a gram stain, um, place the patient on high concentration antibiotic drops um, until you have that culture back. Fungal keratitis, like we said, it tends to be more feathery edged. I'm not sure if they'll actually ask you that on exam, I mean on your exam, but uh, it's good to know the differences. Um, it usually happens after some sort of injury, like you get that fungus up and in, in the eye. Um, you can have it with contact lens wears, um, but like bacterials tends to be more common. Um, when you get an infection, intraocular infection is more common and that's really not a good thing. Um, anytime you get an infection inside the eye itself, 
it is considered sight impairing and has to be treated pretty aggressively. Um, again, with fungal keratitis, it can be hard to diagnose because it's kind of a slower onset thing. Um, there are some topical agents you can use. You can also use systemic azoles, uh, but they're not as helpful because we want to get the medication right to where it needs to go. Now with these, because it takes so long and you get that, er that erosion into the cornea, sometimes you actually have to have some grafting, surgical, and it takes a while to heal. So I've never seen this before. Um, I'm sure it's testable because it's pretty clear to see that annular lesion there. Uh, so acanthamoeba keratitis is um, is a severe and you get this ring infiltrate. So if you see someone that's been you know swimming in fresh water or something like that, then you might think acanthamoeba. Um, it's hard to treat. Uh, and a lot of times these patients have to have corneal grafting and things afterwards. I don't expect you to know too much about it, but just be familiar with it. Um, it takes pretty intensive treatment, um, so I don't expect you to know too much about it, but if you see that ring lesion, it should cross your mind. One thing that you probably will see in your career is a viral keratitis. Most notable, viral keratitis is notably caused by herpes simplex. It can be caused by herpes zoster or herpes simplex, but when we talk about herpes zoster, it's a different diagnosis, herpes zoster ophthalmicus, whereas viral keratitis is usually the herpes simplex one keratitis. Um, so let's talk about it a little bit more. I think we cover it also on um, part two lecture. When you talk about keratitis on these, what you'll do is you'll see, you a lot of times see these little um, blister vesicular lesions in and around the eye or the nose. And then you'll always want to look inside the eye via fluorescein stain for what we call dendritic ulcers. So dendrit dendritic ulcers to me look like either little lightning bolts or little neurons. They kind of branch. They look like this, like little lightning bolts or neurons on the eye. So we get that by doing the fluorescein stain. If we see that in conjunction with a red eye or with a zoster or a simplex, they need to be referred for ophthalmology. Um, they need to be placed on oral acyclovir and they can also be treated with a topical antiviral. Um, and these, they can cause significant problems with the eye if not treated properly. We will cover um, herpes ophthalmicus again, but I just wanted to mention it in this lecture as well. And we'll talk about some of the differences between the two. So earlier we talked about the little cute pinguecula, right? The little fatty globule heel here. Uh, but there is another condition called pterygium. It also starts with a P, but it's not pronounced. It's pronounced pterygium. And the pterygium is an overgrowth that happens usually also on the nasal side of the, of the sclera. But the difference between pterygium and piguecula, one of the differences, is that it does not respect the corneal border. It, does, it can grow over the cornea and thus can be um, somewhat sight impairing. Um, these tend to happen in areas that are dry uh, with increased sun exposure and wind, sand, dust, like the desert equator areas and... Uh, again, they, they, they like to have you differentiate between pterygium and pinguecula. And diagnosis is clinical, so this is my way of trying to remember it. So pterygium comes from that wing, pterodactyl, right? So I think of it kind of as a wing that can go over the cornea, whereas the pinguecula is a cute little penguin there. Um, again, it's slow, slow growing, kind of fleshy. Patients notice it, especially if it's starting to grow over the cornea. Of course, patients are going to notice that. Um, you just you diagnose it by looking with a clinic with physical exam. It's usually painless. Sometimes it can cause a little bit of um, discomfort or it can be um, again block some of the vision, but it shouldn't be particularly painful. Treatment in uh, most cases just some artificial tears, uh, recommending decreased sun exposure, wearing um, sunglasses and things. But if it does either cause 
a cosmetic issue or sight vision threatening, then you can have um, surgery to remove it. So here's a cute little med comic the, um, differentiating the pterygium and the pinguicula. So we've been going for about 38 minutes. So right now, if you want to take a quick break, it might be a good opportunity for you to get up, stretch your legs. We're about halfway done. Uh, and then come back and we'll keep, keep on trucking. All right, so... Next up, we're going to be covering some lacrimal disorders. So lacrimal, lacrimation, you know, that's tearing or tear production. Now, the eye, the surface of the eye has to remain clear so that light can go in and we can see. And one of the ways that we maintain moisture in the eye are by, the, by means of tear production. <clears throat> and we have a tear duct. Remember, our lacrimal gland, sorry, our gland is located in the upper outer part of, of our eye socket. So this is where the nose would be, right here, okay? So the lacrimal gland is in the upper outer part. The tears are secreted on the eye, and as we blink, we flush the tears kind of in this direction, and the tears collect in the, in the, in the uh, carnicle, and then are passed through little holes here that go through a ductal system, uh, the canaliculi, and into the lacrimal sac, and then the, the tears come out through our nose. So that's why you notice if you're crying, uh, that a lot of times your nose is running simultaneously. Um, so we have two conditions. One condition, dacroadenitis, has to do um, with the gland, and dacrocystitis has to do with the duct. So first we're talking about dacroadenitis. So it is inflammation of the lacrimal gland, uh, a lot of times it's caused by bacteria or virus that causes inflammation. Uh, patients get pain and swelling uh, up in the supratemporal area of the orbit, so up in the upper outer part. And a most common cause is the virus, the mumps virus. You can also get it with Epstein-Barr. You can get staph, gonococcal. Uh, how will present, patients usually present with unilateral swelling kind of in the upper outer side where the lacrimal gland is located. Um, it's not as common as dacryocystitis, but you can see it. Um, you can get it with measles, mumps, the flu. In adults, we tend to see it more in gonorrhea. Um, diagnosis can be clinical if you, if you see it. If you're concerned that it could be spreading past that, that uh, that gland area and getting more into like the orbital area, then you might get a CT to look for the extent of, of the infection. Um, this is a little picture differentiating dacryoadenitis by dacryocystitis. Um, and you can see the differences here. So treatment, if it's a virus, there really isn't much to do, just rest, warm compresses. Other treatments, I mean, depends if it's a bacteria, you treat it with antibiotics. Dacryocystitis, in contrast, is an inflammation or infection of the ductal system. So we see the infection happen in the nasal part of the eye. And we tend to see it kind of in two different age groups. We see it in infants, uh, and we see it in women, kind of 40-plus women. Um, and it's caused by an obstruction. 
So when we see it in the infants, uh, the obstruction tends to be with kind of just the buildup of the sludge from being born. So you get kind of this black black blockage or backup of kind of that uh, greasy material that babies are born with and it blocks those ducts and in those cases those obstructions um, most of the time as long as they, the infection doesn't spread it's just the obstruction itself you can kind of apply warm compresses and the the obstruction kind of resolves on its own uh, if it is acutely infected it can be caused by multiple different pathogens including staph um, strep uh, and H flu. Um, you can also have come a more chronic issue that happens. So if you get an acute, it can kind of spread out those ducts a bit, kind of get inflamed. They lose some of their integrity and you can be prone to more chronic infection. Uh, you can get culture and gram stain for confirmation. Clinically, how they present, they get this swelling and redness of the uh, inframedial the, around the, the nasal lacrimal duct area, pain, swelling, tenderness, um, and then they get a lot more tearing because the ducts block, so the tears are coming out of the eye instead of going into the duct. It's usually unilateral. Some might even have kind of purulent discharge where if you push on this red part, uh, pus comes out. Like we mentioned before, um, newborns, uh, tend to have some sten stenosis or blockage and it kind of resolves on its own. Uh, acute, so you can get it, that's usually where it's hot, red, hot, swollen. Uh, you can also have more chronic problems um, because of it. Treatment, so for acute dacryocystitis, you're going to need antibiotic therapy just like any other infection. Um, according to the sources, I had a Clinda plus a third generation cephalosporin will cover the likely culprits. Uh, a lot of times surgery can be done electively um, and sometimes acutely depending on how bad it is to get some of that pus out of there. Um, again with a congenital uh, it usually resolves spontaneously so not much has to be done. All right you can see there's a lot of pus in here so sometimes they have to be surgically excised, antibiotics, just like other types of purulent infection. All right, so let's talk about some of the lid disorders. And we're talking about the external eye, the eyelids. Um, I don't have a good picture of the eyelids, but you know we have the upper and lower eyelid. Within the eyelids, we have uh, mybobian glands, which are responsible for like the um, mucoid. Um, secretions that help lubricate our eye. We also have a couple other glands, uh, Zeiss and Mole, that are in there that help uh, lubricate the eye. And so we'll talk about those a little bit later as we go on. First off, we're going to talk about blepharitis. Now, the bleph means the, the eyelids and ritis means inflammation or infection. Uh, so blepharitis is a chronic inflammation of the eyelids. So it's not mass, it's not with masses, it's more just like a little bit swollen and inflamed. Um, it can cause discomfort, uh, but it doesn't typically cause a significant pain. And there are many different uh, etiologies for blepharitis, including um, uh, dysfunction of the mybobian gland, uh, staph infections, viruses, seborrheic, and even parasitic. Um, you can also have it highly associated with seborrhea, as you, as you learned in germ and rosacea. They get kind of this greasiness to their eyelids. Uh, these patients also have kind of a crust in the morning. And they can, it can be a recurrent cause of conjunctivitis. So how do these patients present? Well, they have irritation, burning, itching, pain, pain or discomfort to the lid margins uh, along the lashes. And they can get some erythema, they can get crustiness, they can have eyelash loss. And then, of course, if they also have a history of seborrhea, they might have the, that greasy or scaly appearance and also up, uh, you know, on other places in the face. On physical exam, the eyelid mar margins tend to have this crust, erythema, ulceration. You can even see kind of pus coming out the little ducts here. Uh, it's usually along the, the lid margins. 
Uh, you can also get kind of scales, granulations. Uh, you can get telangiectasias, inflamed glands. Uh, diagnosis is made usually clinically. We usually do kind of a slit lamp examination. So the slit lamp we mentioned in the intro lecture is a specialized um, kind of a, a telescope, I guess, or something to look at the eye more closely. Um, you, if chronic blephritis happens, which can, you might need to get biopsies and things, but that's going to be for specialty care. So you treat blephritis um, with... Usually, initially, warm compresses, lid massage, antibiotics, if it, te if it seems to be uh, bacterial. Uh, you, they also teach to use it like a baby shampoo to try to keep it clean. Um, irrigation, massages, compresses. Again, antibiotics for flare-ups if it's, if it's bacterial in nature. Um, for lo more long-term things, uh, you might have to use some other more specialized treatments, which... We will let the, the dermatologist or ophthalmologist take care of that. So as we get older, our structure our, within our skin uh, tends to break down. And so we lose some of the elasticity. And just like in other places of the body where we get wrinkles and sagging, uh, we get the same around our eyelids. And so an ectropion, ek meaning kind of outward, uh, is outward um, turning of the, the lid of the eye. And so they tend to look like basset hounds, like this. Um, and it happens with age, you know, with loss of, el loss of elasticity. And this uh, lid margin droops outward. And you might notice excessive tearing, but the eyes are actually dry. And that's because they're not adequately lubricating. They're not able to close properly. And so you're the eyes are tearing because the eyes are dry. They're also not sweeping the tears properly because the eyes just don't close right. So you don't have to do anything lab work-wise. It's a clinical diagnosis. Um, and, I mean, you can make it by looking at the patient. It's very common in older population. My grandpa had these on both of his eyes. And he had a lot of discomfort with his eyes. They were always dry and irritated. And so if they're mild, there's really not much to do. Tear supplements, you can use some lubrication, especially at night when they're trying to close their eyes to sleep. But the definitive treatment is going to be surgical correction. Uh, and it's a pretty minor surgery, and it works really well. My grandpa actually had it on both of his eyes. Um, indications for surgery would be, you know, discomfort that's, that's distracting from everyday life, especially excessive tearing, um, exposure. So because you're not able to close your eyes well, you can get exposure and get some inflammation of the cornea, and also if it's a cosmetic issue, right? So the opposite of an ectro ectropion is an intropion. An intropion is an inward turning of the lid, um, usually the lower lid, and if you can imagine, I mean, all these little eyelashes are literally like scraping your eye. I don't know if any of y'all have ever gotten something in your eye before. I know I have, and it's like the worst feeling. Can you imagine something just... Every time you blink, scratching your eye, I mean, it's really, I think, I think about it and it makes my eyes water. Uh, it's so uncomfortable. Um, it causes a foreign body insult. It can cause scarring to the eye, redness and tearing uh, because of the constant rubbing. I mean, think about how many times you blink throughout the day. Imagine you're, and it, it comes from the same, the same issue as the ectropion, uh, meaning the loss of elasticity, but instead of the loss of elasticity causing an outward drooping, it's an inversion of the eyelid. Um, symptomatic treatment, the same kind of stuff, tear supplements, lubrication. You can also use some Botox for this, uh, but the definitive treatment, again, is surgery. And the indications for surgery are going to be, you know, lashes that are rubbing on the cornea, recurrent abrasion or irritation, so to improve quality of life and vision. A hordeolum is also known as a sty. That's the layman's term. It's what your patients will probably be familiar with. Uh, sty uh, is a, probably a lot of us have had one. I know I've had several before. Is a, a little infection of the lid margin 
Uh, you can have an internal or an external hordeolum, depending on where the blockage is and where the inflammation or infection is. Staph is a very common pathogen, the most common pathogen. Uh, sometimes internal hordeolums, meaning on the inside of the lid margin, uh, can can cause generalized cellulitis. Um, these right here are both external hordeolums. You can see a head to them. Uh, and there are also internal, which are here on the inside. Uh, patients usually present with pain, redness, swelling to the eye, um, and infection. So it can, can be a little drainy sometimes. Um, like I mentioned before, you can have an external hordeolum, which you can see on the outside of the lid, or an internal, which is on the inside. It can be um, blocking of the mybobian glands or of the glands of Zeiss or Moll, like I mentioned before. And sometimes these internal hordeolums can actually develop into clasions, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But think of hordeolums as painful and infected and acute. How do we treat them? Well, one, we encourage patients conservatively to apply warm compresses. Uh, we typically prescribe topical antibiotics, although they're not always necessary. Um, if we do have to give them something topical, antibiotics, either ointment or drops work well. Um, if no response or if you see a, a really big head to it, you can elect to uh, do, perform an incision and drainage. Sometimes if I see one in the ER that's really it's external and really visible, like it's come to a head and it's ready to burst. I actually kind of just take an 18 gauge and just unroof the head of it and let it drain with warm compresses. Um, systemic antibiotics are rare for just plain old hordeolums, but sometimes, as with any other infection, if you have a small little abscess or infection, that which is essentially what this is, a little abscess on the eyelid, um, it can extend uh, into more of a cellulitis and if you have that then you should consider a more systemic antibiotic which cover uh, staph. So a chalazion is a blockage of the mebobian gland so internal on in the eye uh, however these are not painful or they shouldn't be painful. Um, they they can be large and kind of um, what's the word kind of rubbery feeling at times and sometimes they can develop from internal hordeolum but they can be on either the upper or the lower lid and they tend not to be red uh, but they do they are swollen they're it's a lump kind of like a little pea uh, and it, it's, it shouldn't be painful to the patient now it can grow big to where it causes some discomfort but it shouldn't be painful especially in vignettes in vignette world it should be painless uh, it can be hard, a little indurated, rubbery feeling, and it, it shouldn't be inflammatory, right? Um, it should be more of an insidious onset, like it's been there for a while. And some of these can go away on their own with warm compresses, um, and they resolve. Some of them have to be surgically removed or the, have those ducts expressed so that the that the chalazion can uh, can clear itself. It said in my resource that you can give topical antibiotics. However, if if it does not appear to be acutely infected, there's no redness, no pain, no uh, acuteness to it, I would not give um, topical antibiotics for a chalazion. And so here's another little um, metacomic differentiating hordeolum and chalazion. I think they're pretty easy to differentiate though. Alright, so we've covered most of the external stuff. Now we're going to move into some of the more detailed neural neuro ophthalmologic disorders. Now I will be frank with you, um, you probably covered a little bit of this back when you did neuro. 
And so I, I am not going to cover nystagmus and papilledema as in-depth as I am optic neuritis. We're just going to kind of skim the surface on that um, and we'll move on. So nystagmus, as we know, is uh, abnormal movement of the eye. Uh, there are essentially two main types of nystagmus. There's the congenital type and the acquired type. So congenital meaning happens during infancy. We see this commonly between six weeks and three months old. And a lot of these do, do not, um, they do not self-correct. They kind of just get older and the, the kids kind of get used to having it. Um, and so they can develop more of a clear vision even despite the movement of the eyes. Now, acquired astigmas, like it mentions in the name, comes later on in life. There's a whole bunch of different medical conditions that can cause acquired nystagmus, um, both uh, neurologic conditions, vestibular conditions, and these patients, because they get it later in life, have trouble uh, seeing because they have kind of the shaky vision. So uh, nystagmus as a is, is rarely kind of its own thing except for maybe the congenital it's usually associated with other things so um it's involuntary repetitive movement of the eyes there's different types horizontal uh which is the most common type there's a vertical and then there's also a rotary i don't expect you to really know the difference between them um so you'll notice it on exam you can kind of notice a little bit on these um gifs over here on the side there is a way to uh, assess for nystagmus can actually um, stimulate nystagmus in a normal patient by doing a caloric reflex test, um, which you apply uh, warm and cold water within the ear to activate the vestibular system, which then, um, which then stimulates nystagmus to occur, and that's actually a normal finding. And so there's different types of um, eye monitoring systems uh, the ENG and the VNG to uh, keep an eye on, literally keep an eye on how how the the eye movements are stimulated by these different uh, stimuli. Uh, I don't expect you to know a whole lot about that. Uh, caloric testing, it, uh, at the very very minimum, is to see if we do have normal. Um, nystagmus as a reflex to hot and cold stimuli within the ear. Um, the only thing that I've ever seen really be tested on this is the cow's mnemonic kind of thing. So essentially, um, the patient is laying there and you apply cold water into the ear canal. And if you put cold water into the ear canal, the nystagmus fast beat will go opposite of the ear that you place the cold water in. So cold opposite co uh, and so when the nystagmus again it's a side to side movement a horizontal nystagmus there's a fast beat and a slow phase a fast beat is the one that we're looking at for the caloric test now when we put warm water in the ear uh, the ws so warm would be the same we'll see the fast beat go towards the warm water side and those are normal findings there's actually some youtube videos online you can watch like some medical students doing it on each other's just to see the reaction. It's kind of cool to see um, if you want to take a look at that. So traditionally, con congenital nystagmus has been used kind of like non-treatable. There are some medications that have been used more recently. I don't expect you to know about them. Um, there's also things you can do like contact lenses, rehabilitation, uh, and some other surgeries and things which I don't expect you to know much about. We will revisit nystagmus a bit when we get to the vestibular system. So we talk about vertigo and things. But for now, we'll move on to optic neuritis. So optic nerve, the optic nerve, cranial nerve two, is the nerve that helps us see, right? It is our visual nerve. And optic neuritis, as it says in the name, is an inflammation of the optic nerve. Uh, and the most common etiology seen with it, the most common cause, is um, uh, multiple sclerosis. So other, other things that can cause um, optic neuritis are uh, infections, autoimmune disorders, IBD, 
and also um, the ethambutol in the ripe therapy starts with an E, it can cause eye problems, right? Uh, mo but in most cases, what I've seen um, from presentations is association with multiple sclerosis, especially like the first time that they have, um, that they find out that they have multiple sclerosis. The mean age is about 32, it's more common in women. So what do we see in optic neuritis? In optic neuritis, we see acute inflammation of the optic nerve, which is connected to the eyeball. Uh, you get some demyelination of the optic nerve as well. And what we have in the patient complains of is monocular vision loss, so one eye, loss of vision, blurriness, pain with movement of the eye. And that's because as you're moving the eye, the eye is tethered to the brain by the optic nerve and the optic nerve is what's inflamed so if you're moving the eyeball it's pulling on the nerve and it's causing pain and the pain is usually pretty significant pretty severe um, like we mentioned before in multiple sclerosis the most common cause in optic neuritis is usually the initial presenting symptom like they come to the ER to their doctor because of the pain that they're having and the vision loss in their eye it usually kind of happens over a few hours. It can happen over hours to days. And sometimes you can have a recent flu-like or viral type syndrome. Uh, on exam, monocular, one eye, decreased visual acuity and dyschromanopsia, which is decrease of color perception. So like, like you see here, uh, you see kind of uh, a less color than you did before. Blurry and less color. Um, so that's dyschromanopsia. And on fundoscopic exam, you'll see papillitis, so inflammation and swelling of the optic disc. Um, you can also see some flame hemorrhage and things, and you get what's called a Marcus Gunn pupil. This video here, if you come back and watch it, is really good at describing what exactly a Marcus Gunn pupil is. I'll try to make it really simple, although sometimes it's hard to simplify things like this. So let's say I have optic neuritis on the right eye. My right optic nerve is not receiving the right type, the same amount of visual stimuli as my left because it's inflamed. So if I shine a light in my eyes, I should get pupillary constriction, right? Because the optic nerve perceives the light, sends that afferent sign back to the brain and the brain sends efferent signals back to the eye to pupillary constrict, right? Now, if my right eye is, my right optic nerve is damaged, my perception of light is less. So I'm not perceiving the same amount of light in that eye as I should be. So what, they, what, what you do to diagnose a Marcus Gunn pupil is, I don't know if you ever watched like Grey's Anatomy or something where they get their pen light and they swing it back and forth from one eye to the next. They swing it back and forth. Uh, what will happen is my left eye, when I, when I shine the light in my left eye, I will get pupillary constriction. Okay, because my left optic nerve is perceiving. I will get pupillary constriction in both eyes because my efferent is working, right, on both eyes. Now, if I take my light and swing it from my good eye, which is my left eye, swing it to my right eye, because that eye is not perceiving the same amount of light, I will actually observe a relative dilation of both eyes. It's not really dilating, I mean, it is dilating, but it's not really dilating, it's more just not constricting as much as the good eye, okay? And so that's considered a Marcus Gunn pupil or a relative afferent pupillary defect. Now, if that's still confusing to you, I'd like you to come back and watch this, this video because it will explain it in about 10 minutes and it'll show you some examples with some questions that you can ask about it. So, we, and again, we tend to see this Marcus Gunn pupil in optic neuritis. We can also see it in like retinal detachments and other things. So diagnosis is made clinically and with fundoscopy, you see this swelling of the optic disc uh, you also get MRI to confirm the demyelination of the optic nerve. Um, these patients are treated with steroids, IV, usually IV met methylprednisolone, and um, they have to be referred to neurology. 
So papilledema is a finding more than it is a diagnosis. So it's essentially swelling of the optic disc and that is secondary to increased intracranial pressure. So papilledema is associated with something else that's increasing the pressure within the brain uh, or in the intracranial area and that's causing a finding that we can see on the fundus on fundoscopy. So you see optic disc swelling um, and there are early, there's no real early symptoms, although sometimes patients can describe kind of a little bit of a blurry or disturbed visual field and headaches. Um, but papilledema is a scary finding. If we see it, we should be looking into something going on intracranially. Uh, so sometimes, most of the time patients are asymptomatic. You know, they, they kind of... Uh, can present kind of transiently without a whole lot, maybe a little bit of blurry vision, headache, uh, but essentially the symptom is going to be related to what's causing the problem to begin with. As far as the eye, it's just a finding that we see. You'll see blurred disc margins, um, congested disc. They can have flame hemorrhages, infarcts, which we'll talk about a little more in the eye lecture part two, but you see the swelling of the optic disc here. Diagnosis is made by looking at the eye. You can also get, you're going to have to try to figure out what the cause is. What is causing this papilledema? Because it doesn't just happen on its own. And so some of the things you're going to start looking for are brain tumors, abscesses, trauma, hemorrhage, meningitis. There's something else going on that is increasing that pressure within the head and causing this finding on the eye. Um, so going to need to do scans of the head, CSF, and things like that, So, which is more neuro-y. Uh, but just know that if you see this on exam, you need to go looking for something. So treatment, again, is just treatment of the underlying disorder. Um, and if you can't decrease the intracranial pressure, then you can have trouble with atrophy vision loss over time, which is serious. So there's going to be a lot of other serious neurologic problems depending on what's causing it but that's just one of the many things that can happen if it continues with high pressure over time last couple things we have uh, here for you are the orbital disorders, uh, orbital cellulitis and periorbital cellulitis. So orbital cellulitis is an infection of the soft tissue, like where the muscles and the, the fat behind the eye sit. So orbital cellulitis is, it's bad. Okay. Periorbital cellulitis, not as bad, uh, but still infected. So orbital cellulitis is not good. Okay. Um, it's in the posterior part of the eye. These type of infections can spread, can cause meningitis, it can cause abscesses in the brain. They can be pretty significant, can actually lose vision in the eye. So these are bad. We have to do something about them. Uh, typically caused by staph, uh, strep, and anaerobes. Periorbital cellulitis, on the other hand, is more common. Uh, it's it's inf infection of like the lids and the periocular tissues, the skin around the eye. I see it a lot in pediatric populations. And this is anterior. This is not the kind that are we're worried about it spreading to your brain and things. A lot of times seen with like upper respiratory infections and such. So let's talk about orbital cellulitis first. Remember, this is the bad one, okay? A lot of times can be caused by untreated sinusitis. Again, we see it more often in kids than adults. And it is, it's rare, um, but you can get decreased vision 
if you don't treat this properly. Uh, on these, you're going to see uh, eyelid redness, edema, warm, tender. It might start with one. It can go to both. You might have something preceding it, like a trauma or something uh, break in the skin. Um, these patients can be pretty sick. They can have fever. They can even, with the swelling behind the eye and the fat behind the eye, you can get proptosis where the eye kind of looks like it's bulging outward. And because of that, it's limiting motion of the extraocular muscles. And so you can get restriction of movement of the eye because of that. These patients look pretty sick. I've actually seen one case before. Uh, it was a young lady. They actually put her in a hallway bed uh, when I was working in Dallas. And I you know, went to see her thinking, oh, it's just an eye problem. And I looked at her and I was like, whoa, she had some proptosis. Her eye was redder than this. She was African-American, so it wasn't red on the outside of the skin, but it was super swollen. She couldn't see. And I just knew this wasn't like your typical pink eye, you know. And so we ended up doing a CT and she had orbital cellulitis. She got admitted for IV antibiotics. Um, but anyways, uh, CT is usually what we do f to help diagnose, to look for abscess formation. We also get blood work on these patients, CBCs, um, usually a basic metabolic, blood cultures um, to know what we're treating. If there is a discharge to the, to the area, you can also get um, a, a culture of that. Um, they, these patients require hospitalization, IV antibiotics um, to cover the different pathogens. Periorbital cellulitis is a lot more manageable. It's a lot less crazy, um, but it's more common. You see a lot in peds, like, same as, as orbital cellulitis, more so than adults. But you get this uh, redness kind of in and around the eye. It can be a little warm, a little tender. Uh, but you notice that the eye is not bulging. Um, the patient can move their eye. They look pretty comfortable. Normal extraocular movements. Now, if you're concerned, sometimes babies are not the easiest to examine. They don't really tell you too much. Uh, and sometimes they're quite uncooperative. So if you're concerned that it could be uh, proceeding onto an orbital cellulitis or some sort of abscess, you can get a CT to help rule that out. Uh, the treatment for this is going to be oral antibiotics, um, like an augmentin or a cephalosporin. With that, we are done with eye day one. Uh, here's a few bad eye puns uh, to help uh, close out eye day number one. Um, we will proceed on with some more eye stuff, and then we'll move on. ENT goes by in a flash, so make sure you're staying on top of your lectures, on top of your reading, doing your questions periodically, and we'll get through. Thanks for your attention. See you next time.